to be here at this excellent university and I'm proud to say that both my office manager and my caseworker uh, studied here under uh, Andy and they're a great uh, uh, tribute to your university and a huge asset to me today. Let me um, start with the motivations for writing this book and where it came from. As Bob mentioned in his introduction, uh, two and a half years ago I published a book about Alice Bacon who was Yorkshire's first female MP. She was elected in 1945 and served until 1970 as a Member of Parliament for Leeds North East and then Leeds South East. And perhaps incredibly, I think it is anyway, she was the only woman to represent any of the Leeds constituencies until I was elected in 2010. So for 40 years, all eight Members of Parliament in Leeds were men. And I feel very strongly that every generation owes something to those who have gone before them. And so when I was elected, I wanted to find out a little bit more about Alice Bacon, the only woman to have done the job that I am now doing in Leeds before me. And so I ended up writing her biography. And in writing that, I felt that she was in many ways written out of our history. She achieved remarkable things. She was um, born the son of daughter of a coal miner in Normanton in, in West Yorkshire. She then went on to become both an MP and then a minister under Harold Wilson and was incredibly important in introducing comprehensive education as well as some of the social liberal reforms that we saw in the 1960s. And yet, she has been so forgotten. And I felt that it was probably the case that she wasn't the only woman in Westminster for who that was true. And so I decided when I completed that book to research a little bit more about some of those forgotten women and also some of the better known ones and write this book on the 100th anniversary of the first woman to take her seat in Parliament, and that woman was uh, Nancy Astor. So let's go back to 1919, and actually just a little bit before, until 1918. We all know that in February 1918, women won the right to vote. Some women, not all. You had to be over 30 and meet some property qualifications, whereas all men over the age of 21 could vote. A bit later that year, in just ahead of the 1918 general election, Parliament passed a very short bill which also enabled women to stand for Parliament. But it was just six weeks before the general election. The Prime Minister at the time, uh, Asquith, said, they've got the camel, why strain at the gnat? He wasn't a big fan of, uh, of, of suffrage for women, but he felt that if women were, had the right to vote in elections, they should be allowed to stand as well, in part because all the politicians feared a backlash against them if women could vote, but they weren't allowed to stand for Parliament. But because women only had six weeks in which to get selected and fight an election campaign, very few of them stood, and only one was elected, and that woman was Constance Markovitz. But she was elected as a Member of Parliament for Sinn Féin, and as is the tradition of that party, she didn't take her seat in Parliament. And she was actually in prison at the time for high treason, so even if she had wanted to, it might have been a little bit tricky. So the first woman to get elected and take her seat in Parliament was Nancy Astor, and she was elected in November 1919. Uh, she was the wife of Waldorf Astor, and he had been the MP for Plymouth Sutton. His father was in the House of Lords and he died suddenly and because Waldorf Astor was his oldest son, he inherited his father's seat in the House of Lords and so he could no longer be a member of Parliament. But he wanted to come back to Parliament and so he needed to find somebody to be a stopgap MP in Plymouth Sutton and so he decided his wife should be the candidate. So Nancy Astor stood but it was supposed to be only a temporary arrangement so that he could get back in to his seat. That temporary arrangement actually lasted for 26 years until Nancy Astor stood down in 1945. So what was it like for Nancy Astor and those early women in Parliament? Well, Nancy said that her fellow MPs would have rather have had a rattlesnake in the chamber of the House of Commons rather than her. And I think she was almost certainly right because she was beginning to break up this cosy all-male club that had existed in Westminster for so many hundreds of years. Winston Churchill, who was a friend of the Astors, said to Nancy that having a woman in Parliament was a little bit like a woman walking into his bathroom when he had nothing to defend himself except for a sponge. <laughs> now, Nancy retorted, you're not good looking enough to have such concerns, Winston. <laughs> but again, it gives you 
an indication of the sense of hostility that was experienced by those early women in Westminster. When women were elected to Parliament, or when women were given the right to stand for Parliament in 1918, the parliamentary authorities also had to decide what to do with these women if they got elected. And so something called the Lady Members Room was established. But perhaps, um, perhaps predictably, the Lady Members Room was located down two flights of stairs, about a quarter of a mile from the debating chamber, and it was quickly nicknamed by the women MPs as the Dungeon. So again, you get an idea that there wasn't particularly sumptuous surroundings in which the women had to, uh, to work in. Uh, the, the dungeon did okay for the first few years. It was a room that had in it uh, two, uh, two sofas and seven desks. And in the early years, there were so few women in Parliament uh, that the women had the, their choice of desks on which to work. But by 1945, the number of women in Parliament had increased quite a lot. So it went up to 24 in 1945, which might not sound a lot today, but it was a trebling of the numbers compared to the previous general election. And I describe in the book uh, uh, what that room was like in 1945. If the lady members' room boasted a larger-than-life atmosphere during this era, it was anything but in terms of physical space. Despite significant increases in the number of women MPs, Westminster still felt a little like a boys' school which had decided to take a few girls, as Edith Summerskill put it. The women remained in the dungeon with just seven desks and two couches to accommodate 24 women. With no wardrobe and no pegs for hats or coats, the lady members' room quickly descended into chaos, with scattered belongings and little desks, overflowing waste paper baskets and newspapers half opened, half read, strewn around the room. When pegs were installed, the lack of space meant that the pegs were too close together and the hats too big, so that the room looked like the hour before the jumble sale opened. So these were the surroundings in which the women had to work. But going back to 1919, one of the perhaps trivial, but I think it matters, uh, questions that Nancy Astor had to decide upon is how she was going to dress the Parliament. Now, in 1919, men in Parliament wore full morning suits, uh, including hats. And so Nancy Astor had to decide on what uniform she was going to wear as a member of Parliament. And she settled on dressing for Parliament as if dressing for church in your Sunday best. And so she wore a black skirt and jacket, a white blouse, a tricorn hat, and a gardenia in her buttonhole. And she encouraged the other women MPs to dress similarly. Uh, that worked pretty much until uh, Ellen Wilkinson arrived on the scene in 1924, who decided to dress in flamboyant colours and bright dresses for Parliament. And Nancy Astor tried to dissuade her and encourage her to dress more soberly, but to no avail. But it was also the question of whether women should wear hats in the House of Commons or not. Uh, and I'll just read you a little bit from the book on that question. There was also the persistent hat question. The usual convention in public meetings was that women showed their respect by their heads being covered. Before Astor took her seat, the Times speculated that no doubt she will wear her hat in the house as she would do in a church or chapel. But, it asked, if she wears a hat, should she remove it when she rises to speak, as male MPs are bound to do? It was a dilemma permeated with a sense of annoyance that the rules of the chamber were being challenged by the inappropriateness of the presence of women. A Daily Express headline screamed, Hat problem still unsolved. <laughs> it remained well unsolved well into the 1920s. In 1929, Labour MP Susan Lawrence's usual sobriety saw a brief interlude when, wishing to speak after a division had been called, but having no hat with her, she placed an order paper over her head. The Speaker ruled that in future, women could remain uncovered when speaking in the chamber. The hat problem, at least, was settled. There were many other dilemmas and challenges that the women faced, especially in terms of clothing and space. Another room in Parliament is the smoking room. And it's uh, a room that still exists in Parliament, although you can't smoke in there uh, anymore. But it was a room, even once women had been elected to Parliament, was a bit of a no-go area. Uh, Ellen Wilkinson, who, as I mentioned before, was elected in 1924, decided that these uh, uncodified rules 
that women weren't allowed in the smoking room wouldn't do anymore. And so she walked up to the door of the smoking room and the policeman on the door stopped her and said, excuse me, madam, but ladies are not usually allowed in here. And she said, I am not a lady, I'm a member of parliament, and walked straight in. There's also been much discussion in the last few years about sexual harassment in parliament. And researching this book, you learn that these sorts of things are not new. And one of the people I interviewed, and perhaps the one of the most wonderful thing about writing this book was the interviews that I did with MPs, both past and present. And one of the women I interviewed for the book was Shirley uh, Williams, who is now in the, in the House of Lords, but of course served as a Labour and then an SDP Member of Parliament for many years. And she told me the following story. When walking through the division lobby to vote, Shirley Williams would often find herself being pinched on the bottom by male MPs. When she relayed such experiences to other women, they said it happened to them all the time. So like a coven of witches, they plotted a plan of revenge. When walking through the division lobbies, they would be sure to wear stiletto heels so that they could dig them into the foot of any male MP who made untoward advances. When one of the culprits hobbled into the tea room later that day, several stiletto-clad women gathered around him, fussing and feigning concern. It's only gout, he told them. <laughs> So what issues did these women champion when they got to Parliament? Well, Nancy Astor regarded herself not just as the MP for Plymouth Sutton, but also the Member of Parliament for Women. And every week she received thousands of letters from women across the country asking her to take up their causes. And she regularly met with women from the suffrage movement to ask them what she should be doing in Parliament, what issues she should be championing. And the first piece of what was described as feminist legislation in Parliament happened in 1925, sponsored by Margaret Wintrium, the first woman MP, the second <coughs> woman MP to take her seat in Parliament. She was a Liberal MP for Louth, and seconded by Nancy Astor, who was a Conservative Member of Parliament. And the two of them worked together to bring into law legislation on the equal guardianship of children. Up until 1925, Upon separation or divorce, women had absolutely no rights over their children. The children were the property of their father. And Margaret Wintringham urged male MPs in Parliament to do a mental somersault and to imagine themselves in a position where they desired the custody of their own child, but were denied it. And Wintringham, working with Astor, got onto the statute of <coughs> legislation which ensured the equal guardianship of children. But there were many other issues as well. E um, equal pay will forever be associated, and rightly so, with Barbara Castle. But it was an issue that was championed by many women MPs over the years. And I want to take us back to 1944, when a Conservative MP tabled an amendment on equal pay. So women MPs taking a stance on equal pay in the 1960s and 70s was not new. In 1944, Conservative MP Thelma Castlet Keir had tabled a successful equal pay amendment against her own government, only for it to be quashed by Churchill in a confidence vote. While previous governments had paid lip service to the principle of equal pay for women, action had been confined to the civil service, and even then only in selected areas. In principle, equal pay had been a TUC objective ever since the Match Girls strike of 1888, but it was far from a priority. As Labour MP Leila Jager pointed out in 1970, the average wage for a full-time woman industrial worker was half that of a man. Yet even then, equal pay faced opposition from both Labour and the Conservatives. Essentially, both parties believed that equal pay was desirable, but that it could wait until the economic situation was suitable. Jager disagreed, stating that the more equal pay costs, the more has been women's compulsory subsidy to the wages bill of this country over the years. The internal equal pay debate within Labour was encapsulated by a debate between Barbara Castle and the Labour MP Jenny Lee. Lee thought that until men's wages had reached sufficient levels, the notion of equal pay for equal work was futile. Barbara, we cannot ask for equal pay when miners' wages are so low, she pleaded. In that case, we will wait forever, Castle responded. So the issue of equal pay was one that animated women from across the political spectrum, but there were also debates within the political parties. Then the Catholic here, who I mentioned at the beginning of that passage, introduced, as I said, an amendment 
for equal pay for teachers in 1944, and it was the only vote during the national wartime government that Winston Churchill lost in Parliament. But perhaps, and this is also similar to today, the government then brought back that legislation a few days later and asked for MPs to vote on it again. But on that occasion, Winston Churchill was successful. When he appointed Thelma Castlick here to the government, when he returned as Prime Minister in 1951, Winston Churchill said to Thelma, no more of this equal pay nonsense. So equal guardianship, equal pay, but also the issues of family allowances and child benefit were championed by women. One of the women in the book who I'm ashamed to say I knew very little of before I started this research was Eleanor Rathbone. And she was an independent member of parliament from the 1920s until 1946 when she died. And the cause that she championed was the issue of family allowances to be paid directly to the woman to support the family income. She wrote a book in the 1920s called The Disinherited, Fam the Disinherited Family, and she spoke about women being disinherited from the family income because of work they do, mainly in the home, looking after the family, the housework, and the childcare was unremunerated. And she spoke of every individual having a mouth to feed, a back to clothe, and a mind to nourish. And so she put forward the idea of family allowances and gradually, over the course of many years, and actually of more than a decade of lobbying, they were introduced in the 1940s. But the original proposal by the Conservative government was for the family allowance to be paid to the man. And Eleanor Rathbone said in the debate at the third reading in the bill in Parliament that she would vote against this, even though she had campaigned for it for her whole life, because it had to be paid to the woman. And in the end, Parliament amended the legislation, and so when it came to the vote of third reading, the government acquiesced and agreed that it could be paid to the woman, although they thought that lots of these women were making a lot of fuss about nothing. A similar debate happened when Barbara Castle introduced a child benefits to replace the family allowance, and she too argued passionately that these child benefits should be paid to the main carer and not to the main earner. And the same thing happened again in 1999, when the Labour government introduced tax credits. And the original proposal from the Treasury was again that they should be paid to the main earner and not the main carer. But a group of women MPs, led by Yvette Cooper and Lorna Fitzsimons, went to see Gordon Brown as Chancellor and made the case, as Eleanor Rathbone had and as Barbara Castle had, that these benefits should be paid to the woman because that way they would be used for the good of the family. And they would recognise the work that is done in the home but that it is not paid. And so one of the arguments I try to make in this book is that having women in Parliament has brought to the, uh, brought to the agenda, has brought to the political agenda, issues that are up until then being neglected because women weren't in Parliament to put them on the agenda and to make them political issues. The same is true of childcare. When Harriet Harman was elected in 1982, she raised the issue of the lack of childcare provision in the school holidays, and she was laughed at, not just by Conservative MPs in government, but also by MPs on her own side, who said childcare was not a political issue. Now today, all the political parties, including their manifestos and in budget statements, proposals for childcare to make it more affordable, <coughs> to make it more accessible, to make it of a higher quality. But many of these issues are only political issues today because women made them so. And I think that's really important. But when we argue about whether we need more women in Parliament and what perspective they bring, they have brought to the political agenda issues that weren't there before. But it's also worth noting that many male MPs thought that the only point of having women in Parliament was to bring in issues that were women's issues or children's issues. And Herbert Morrison, who was Deputy Leader of the Labour Party and former Home Secretary, advised the Labour women elected in 1945 to stick to women's issues. Ted Heath, in the 1970s, was asked whether he would like to see more women in Parliament, and he said, yes, but only if they bring a woman's perspective, otherwise there wouldn't be much point in having them there. So there's been this continual debate for the women of whether they want to identify themselves with the women's movement and the feminist cause, or whether they want to jettison that so that they can be taken seriously by their male peers. And it's an issue that has existed for the whole time of having women in Parliament. 
I think, though, beyond the issues of policy and making issues come onto the political agenda, women have also, over time, changed the culture of politics and the culture of Parliament. And that started again in the very early years, particularly on cross-party working. Now, many of the women in Parliament, especially in those early years, were marginalised by their own parties and often ostracised by their male colleagues in Parliament. And having to work in the lady members' room, where they were largely confined, they often found solidarity and friendship, not from their own party MPs, but from the other women in Parliament. And that encouraged, from the early years, that collaboration and cross-party working. As Shirley Summerskill put it, who was the MP for Halifax in the 60s, 70s and 80s, issues like equal pay mattered whichever political party you were from, apart from Jenny Lee perhaps. Uh, and so women worked together on some of these causes. You saw it with equal guardianship, a Liberal MP, Wintringham, working with Astor, a Conservative. But you also saw it on other issues. So Ellen Wilkinson, who very much identified as a socialist and a feminist, worked with the Duchess of Athol, who was incredibly posh and opposed suffrage for women, but was an MP nevertheless. Uh, and along with Eleanor Rathbone, the independent and very serious-minded MP, and they worked to uh, oppose fascis uh, fascism in, in, in Spain and to draw attention to what Franco was doing there, but also to oppose the policy of appeasement by Chamberlain here at home. And the three of them worked together, they visited Spain, they wrote pamphlets, they raised money for children in Spain, uh, and they were ridiculed, again, within their own parties. Ellen Wilkinson, who was only four foot eleven in height, was nicknamed as the Pocket Passionara, the Duchess of Athol was nicknamed as the Red Duchess, all in trying to, uh, to, to undermine them and the causes that they stood for. But by working together, often women uh, found that support and, and solidarity, but also added strength to their numbers. One other area where women worked closely together was during the Second World War, and women MPs from across the political spectrum set up something called the Woman Power Committee, which was intended to help mobilise the war effort of women. As Edith Summerskill said, I wonder what the country would say if the whole question of manpower were dealt with by women. I am beginning to feel that this war is being prosecuted by both sexes, but directed only by one. And so Edith Summerskill, working with the Conservative MPs Irene Ward and Mavis Tate, set up the Woman Power Committee. And as a result, the contribution of women during the Second World War hugely, un out, um, hugely outweighed the contribution in the First World War and was greater than the contribution of women in any other country during that war. And I think that those women in Parliament should take a large amount of the credit for that. More recently, the issue of baby leave has been debated in Parliament and reforms have been intro introduced. Up until January this year, there was no maternity or paternity leave available for members of Parliament, even though MPs had changed the law to ensure that women in other workplaces had those rights. Now, again, this isn't something that mattered hugely in the first 50 or so years of women in Parliament, because no woman MP had a baby as a member of Parliament until 1976, when Helen Heyman gave birth to her first child. Now, 1976 has got to be probably the worst year that a woman could have decided to do that as a Member of Parliament, because pairing had been suspended in the House of Commons. And so the usual arrangements of saying, well, you can have a little bit of time off and we'll pair you with an MP from another party so your votes are cancelled out, that just stopped in 1976. Labour's majority was wafer thin and falling, and so no MP could be spared. And so eight days after having her baby, uh, Helen Heyman returned to the House of Commons for voting and often for all-night sittings. Many of the women who I spoke to for this book, from uh, um, Helen Heyman, who I interviewed, uh, to Harriet Harman, Diane Abbott, Anne Taylor and others, all spoke about the terrible guilt they felt that they weren't a good enough MP and they weren't a good enough mother because it was so difficult to combine in the 70s, 80s and 90s those two responsibilities. Things have got a bit easier since the hours of Parliament have changed, but it's still a big challenge. But in January of this year, 
the work of Harriet Harman along with Maria Miller from the Conservatives and Joe Swinson from the Liberal Democrats and Hannah Bardell from the SNP lobbying and bringing this issue to Parliament has changed the rules on that. And Andrea Leadsom, in January of this year, introduced proxy voting in Parliament for the first time. And Tulip Sadiq, who had her baby in January, was able to take advantage of this on the 29th of January for the first time. And that means during some of the crucial votes that we're having at the moment, another MP can vote by proxy for the MP who is on maternity leave. And that's a huge improvement. Just going back, we'll continue on this subject of, of mothers in Parliament. The first four women to serve in the Cabinet, only one of them was married and none of them had children. Again, I think giving a sense of how difficult it was for women at the highest levels of politics to combine work and family <coughs> life. So Margaret Bonfield, Ellen Wilkinson and Florence Horse were the first three women to serve in the Cabinet. None of them married, none of them had children. Barbara Castle was the next. She married, but she didn't have children. It wasn't until the late 1960s, when Judith Hart was appointed to the cabinet by Harold Wilson, that you had for the first time a mother with school-aged children serving at the highest levels of politics. I, I, there are probably lots of issues that, that we could cover and that I could speak about, and hopefully we'll come to some of them uh, in the question and answer session. I'll just say something about Margaret Thatcher and then I'll say something about the abuse of women in Parliament. For me, writing about Margaret Thatcher was probably the hardest part of this book, for obvious re reasons. And I think most of us, when you come to write about somebody who is so high profile, but also so divisive in our political history, it's hard to approach it in a neutral way. And so the way I tried to attempt those chapters was particularly to talk to some of the women who were in Parliament at the same time as Thatcher. So I interviewed for the book Gillian Shepherd, Linda Chalker, Edwina Curry, and others, who I hope gave me a perspective which was a little bit different from my own. But I was born when um, I was born three months. Uh, I was three months old when Margaret Thatcher became Prime Minister, and from the age of eight, I identified with the Labour cause, and I joined the Labour Party aged uh, 17 because of Margaret Thatcher. And so one of the things I reflected on in this book was about our conceptions of power, and particularly of political power. And although from age eight I knew that I disagreed with Margaret Thatcher and the direction she was taking our country in, I think that I never doubted that a woman could lead and be Prime Minister, because she was there doing that. And I've got a son and a daughter now who are both young, and again, having a woman Prime Minister, even though I disagree desperately, with what she's doing at the moment. Having a woman in that position of power, I think does send out a message, even if you don't agree with them politically, that women can lead, they can hold the highest of offices, and they can inspire a future generation of young women to go into politics, either to emulate them, or in my case, to rebel against what they're doing. But I think also it's important to reflect on some of the challenges that Margaret Thatcher faced as a woman in politics. And she was elected in 1959 as the Member of Parliament for Finchley, but she had gone for many selections for other parliamentary constituencies before she was selected in Finchley. And when she went for the selection in Maidstone, the feedback she had from the local Conservative Association was that she was a very strong candidate, but that she hadn't thought sufficiently about how she was going to combine being a mother and a Member of Parliament. And I very much doubt, even in 1959 or today, that anyone would give feedback to a man to say they hadn't given sufficient thought of how they were going to combine being a father with a member of parliament. And with her own party, even when she was leader, and even when she was prime minister, she faced a huge amount of misogyny. Now, I don't think that excuses the fact that only one woman served in her cabinet in the whole time that she was prime minister. But when she was elected um, as prime minister, when she became prime minister in 1979, there were only 19 other women sorry, 18 other women in Parliament at the time. So there weren't a huge number to choose from, even if she had wanted to bring more on, which I think I would conclude in the book that she didn't really. But I think we need to recognise the challenges that even someone like Margaret Thatcher was operating in and the barriers that they faced as women MPs. I also want to say something about abuse because it's something that's very much in the news at the moment. 
In the early years, it was incredibly difficult for women to put themselves forward. They had to make huge sacrifices. It was difficult to combine having a family life and being a member of parliament because of the hours that parliament sit, sat the very low wages for MPs, which was difficult for women who didn't tend to have an external uh, um, source of, of income. In some ways, those barriers have disappeared. You know, I have two children, I've had those two children since I became a member of parliament. We sit until 10 o'clock on Mondays, 7 o'clock on Tuesdays and Wednesdays. I still think there could be reforms, but there'd be big changes. So what are the barriers today for women entering politics? I think the biggest barrier today is the abuse that MPs face, and particularly the abuse that women in Parliament face. Women MPs now account for 208 of the 650 MPs in Parliament. So we've seen huge change in the last 100 years, when we didn't have any, and a huge change in the last 40 years, when there were just 19 women in Parliament. But despite the fact we make up less than a third of the MPs in Parliament, Women take much more than a third of the abuse that is dished out to members of Parliament, whether that's on social media or whether it is out in the real world. And whether that is what happened to Jo Cox and her murder not quite three years ago, or the fact that four people are in prison today for abuse and death threats against Luciana Berger, or somebody in prison for a death threat uh, against Rosie Cooper, an MP in Lancashire. The fact is, women get a disproportionate amount of the abuse. And if you are a black woman, in the case of Diane Abbott, or a Jewish woman, in the, in the case of Luciana Berger, that abuse is much more targeted, much more gendered, much more uh, uh, racist in its intent. And the point of the abuse is to try and silence people, and particularly to try and silence women, often by people who don't think that women should be speaking out or have a place in public life but facilitated by social media. And I feel very strongly that social media companies should do a lot more to crack down on the abuse, often by anonymous uh, people on social media. But also, we in Parliament need to improve the way that we conduct public debate, but that also needs to be in the country as a whole. I interviewed the Prime Minister for the book, and she put it like this, that there used to be an angry man sitting at the end of the bar in a pub, muttering into his pint, largely ignored by everybody else. <coughs> Today, he finds an audience on social media, and he starts to think that his views are legitimate ones, ones that are shared by many other people. And we need to make clear that that sort of abuse and that sort of behaviour is not acceptable in the public sphere, and the public sphere includes on social media. Because I do worry that a future generation <coughs> of young people, particularly young women, will feel politics is not for them, and they don't want to have to put up with the abuse that they would get for just doing their job. And so I think that as we try to encourage a new generation to put themselves forward, that we need to improve how our politics is conducted, and stand shoulder to shoulder with those people who are facing abuse. I said at the beginning that I wrote this book because I feel that each generation owes something to those who have gone before them. And I feel very strongly, and even more so after writing this book, that I stand on the shoulders of some of the women that I have written about, women from across the political spectrum, from a range of backgrounds, and that I am taller because of them. I hope that this book inspires the next generation, I hope that it educates, but most of all, I hope that it writes back into history some truly remarkable women. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, so just on the social media issue, I don't want to sort of dwell on it too much, but um, so what I interviewed Jess Phillips um, for the book, who gets a, a large amount of abuse, and she uh, talks about the, uh, the strategy that a lot of people are conducting this abuse of, of dogpiling, so they all come in together uh, on you to, to attack you. So you tweet something, you put something out there, and you suddenly get this sort of torrent of abuse. And she encourages her, her followers and her friends to sort of do a reverse thing, to come in on the back of things she say to support her. And I think that sort of strategy and that sort of uh, approach, where if there's somebody uh, who you agree with actually saying that and, and offering your support, it, you know, why do people do it? I go back to this point, they're trying to silence you. They're trying to make you think, actually, there's no point in doing that radio interview or that television interview or posting that thing on social media because I can't be bothered to deal with all the abuse I'm going to get. And so 
if you make that decision not to do it, they've won because they've silenced you. And I think it's really important that you don't give in to that, but you know, you do need the support of others to sort of keep going sometimes. And I interviewed Diane Abbott and Rashmara Ali for the book, and both of them said that they worry about speaking out about the abuse they get because they do worry that it will deter uh, other people from putting themselves in, uh, forward in politics. And, and again, they said that people who work in their office, they come in all excited and think, you know, maybe I'd like to be an MP one day. And both of them worry that at the end of the fortnight or the, uh, the time they spend in the office, they may think, well, it's fantastic they're doing it, but it's not something I would want to, to put up with. And I think that's a real shame. Harriet Harman, when I interviewed her for the book, she said that um, the men should sit out the next leadership contest of the Labour Party. I asked Angela Eagle and Jess Phillips what they thought of that proposal, and they said, I wouldn't hold your breath. Uh, but I think that the Labour Party now, 45% of our MPs are women. There's a, a huge array of talent to choose from, and I very much hope that the next leader of the Labour Party is a woman. Uh, uh, but that does require some men to say, actually, we're going to sign the nomination papers of a great woman, and we're going to get behind her and make sure that she is elected, <coughs> elected as leader of our party, and then elected as Prime Minister. So all parties need to do more. The Conservatives need more women in Parliament. The Labour need more women at the top of the party.